कर्मण्येवाधिकारस्ते मा फलेशु कदाचन मा कर्म फल हेतुर्भू मा ते संगोस्व कर्मणी This film will take you through the story of an extraordinary visionary. We pay tribute to one of the most resplendent intellectuals India has ever seen. The iconic N.J. Yashaswi, the man who founded the Institute of Chartered Financial Analysts of India, ICFI, and ICFI Universities and ICFI Group of Institutions. He leaves behind him a huge network of educational institutions that will stand testimony to the adage what can be imagined can be achieved. Born on 9th February 1950 to father Sri Nanduri Venkateshwar Rao, a school teacher, and Srimati Sita Magaru, a homemaker, the quest of knowledge, the zeal to excel was instilled in him right from his childhood. The spark of brilliance was evident in him right from his school days. His illuminating essays on a wide variety of topics, even when he was in the fourth grade, captured the attention of his teachers, who appreciated and encouraged the remarkable talent in the young Yashasvi. The young boy was a keen and committed learner, and he never repeated an error once it was pointed out to him. N.J. Yashasvi had a brilliant academic career throughout, Graduating from the Andhra University in 1969 with a B.Com degree, he topped the university. In his C.A. Inter in the year 1971, he achieved near impossible scores as first ranker and repeated the academic feat in C.A. Final in 1973. Simultaneously, he bagged the first rank in I.C.W.A. Inter in 1970 an ICWA final in 1972. This spectacular track record of academic achievements reached its zenith when he was given the Basu Foundation Award for the best student of the year from both the Institute of Cost and Works Accountants of India in 1972 and the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India in 1973. A first of its kind achievement in the country an unparalleled performance which made his parents and well-wishers immensely proud. Married to Srimati Shobharani, he had a blissful home atmosphere and the enlightening journey as a father, husband and mentor crossed all boundaries as the most rewarding and enriching experience. Weekends of the while her son would try to churn out hundreds of conversations why hard work and commitment to basic issues were more important than spirituality. N.J. Yashasvi was fortunate to have lived a fulfilling and supremely satisfying family life. His phenomenal career began in a modest manner with a brief stint at ITC as a management trainee. Thereafter, Mr. Yashasvi joined as a faculty member with Administrative Staff College of India in 1974. N.J. Yashasvi spurned an offer to teach at the prestigious University of Singapore's Accountancy Department as he informed Professor Bhanoji Rao Garu that he felt that he had some important contribution to make in India. In 1981, he started his consultancy firm Yashasvi Management Associates Private Limited. And from then onwards, there was no looking back. It was in 1984 that he started the ICFI Society. In 1995, he was instrumental in setting of ICFI business schools across eight locations in India. He was charismatic, a great motivator, never tired of talking about ideas, their execution and delegating projects ably to people according to their strengths. He showed his prowess in corporatizing education and created a sterling model out of it. If you are a man in hurry, it is not the business to be ill. And what I need to say is that it takes at least a hundred years before a university is really recognized in a true sense. The grandfather should study there, then the father should study there,
then the child should study there, then the child's child should study there. A pioneer, a leader, and innovator, NJY created Andhra Pradesh's first private placement industry, first leasing deals, first stock market newsletters, first management consultancy, and the earliest traces of knowledge society. He loved knowledge, science, and new ideas that change the world. Yet, he remained humble, always working with a motivation to do something different, to make a difference to the world of business, education, business education, and publications. I knew Mr. SSC when he joined the Administrative Staff College of India in the year 1974. He taught finance courses. He was an outstanding teacher in that college. He also wrote books in the area of finance and investments, which can be easily understood by common man. He is extremely clear in his thinking. His motive was meritum ethicus, that is provide merit, give preference always to merit and be ethical in all your administration and management practices. He had the flair to make everything look simple to accomplish, even to an ordinary mortal. A powerhouse of energy and enthusiasm, his repertoire of achievements in education is amazing. Whether it was a launching of the Chartered Financial Analyst Program to make true financial management available to the Indian youth way back in 1985, or constantly updating it to suit emerging needs of the Indian financial markets, starting new programs for the changing needs of the reforming and liberalized Indian markets, or redrafting the curriculum for an existing program to align it with the changing business environment, he sailed through them with effortless ease of a true genius. N.J. Yashasvi possessed a remarkable sense of social responsibilities, aesthetics, scientific and capital to get optimal and even phenomenal returns with scarce resources. A gifted communicator, N.J. Yashasvi masterfully articulated the need for a new university with government authorities and went on to establish universities with competent faculty, duly supported by requisite infrastructure, designed the campus for a newly approved university, challenging great odds in his own inimitable style. Bequeathing the coming generations with a rich legacy of publications, he published innumerable books on current topics of management with his unabated desire to bring the latest knowledge to the doorsteps of the Indian Academic Institute. An achiever par excellence, N.J. Yashasvi was, however, not one to court publicity. His favorite retreat was his corner chair, surrounded by his books and photos in plot number 19, Nagarjuna Hills, from where he generated ideas that changed the educational scenario. And his worthy emissaries emulated his ideals, touching the peaks of success and turning their mentors' dreams into vibrant realities. In the last two years, he started several new projects, Turning to his roots, giving his mother tongue and traditions of Philip, he ventured to promote Carnatic music, established B.Ed. colleges, and also a unique initiative called C.P. Brown Academy, which is today successfully bringing timeless works of Telugu arts and literature within reach of the current generation. NJY achieved so much at just 61, and yet there were so many projects at hand, his entrepreneurial zeal never diminished. For his unrivaled contributions to education, Sri Yashasvi truly deserves a place in the history of the business scenario of Andhra Pradesh and Indian education in general for his life's work. Thousands of employees of the Ikfai Gruis, including people, grew like saplings under the banyan tree called Ikfai, which spawned the biggest service sector boom in education, research, publication and policy making. Some of India's most successful fund managers, analysts, bankers, journalists, software and management professionals, thought leaders and thinking elite have some connection or the other with ICFI. Either they worked at ICFI or they studied at ICFI and its associate wings. The causes he expounded were noble and it is the duty of his protégés to carry them forward. 
This is the greatest tribute one can pay to him, standing as living testimonies of his life's mission. कर्मण्येवाधिकारस्ते मा फलेशु कदाचन मा कर्म फलगे तुर्भू मा ते संगोस्त्व कर्मणी This film will take you through the story of an extraordinary visionary. We pay tribute to one of the most resplendent intellectuals India has ever seen. The iconic N.J. Yashaswi, the man who founded the Institute of Chartered Financial Analysts of India, ICFI, and ICFI Universities and ICFI Group of Institutions. He leaves behind him a huge network of educational institutions that will stand testimony to the adage, what can be imagined can be achieved. Born on 9th February 1950 to father Sri Nanduri Venkateshwar Rao, a school teacher, and Srimati Sita Magaru, a homemaker, the quest of knowledge, the zeal to excel was instilled in him right from his childhood. The spark of brilliance was evident in him right from his school days. His illuminating essays on a wide variety of topics, even when he was in the fourth grade, captured the attention of his teachers, who appreciated and encouraged their remarkable talent in the young Yashasvi. The young boy was a keen and committed learner, and he never repeated an error once it was pointed out to him. N.J. Yashasvi had a brilliant academic career throughout, Graduating from the Andhra University in 1969 with a B.Com degree, he topped the university. In his C.A. Inter in the year 1971, he achieved near-impossible scores as first ranker and repeated the academic feat in C.A. Final in 1973. Simultaneously, he bagged the first rank in I.C.W.A. Inter in 1970 an ICWA final in 1972. This spectacular track record of academic achievements reached its zenith when he was given the Basu Foundation Award for the best student of the year from both the Institute of Cost and Works Accountants of India in 1972 and the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India in 1973. A first of its kind achievement in the country an unparalleled performance which made his parents and well-wishers immensely proud. Married to Srimati Shobharani, he had a blissful home atmosphere and the enlightening journey as a father, husband and mentor crossed all boundaries as the most rewarding and enriching experience. Weekends at the NJY home was always known for his warm welcome to his circle of friends and associates. There would be a fruitful exchange of knowledge 
and fun, delicious home cooked food and engaging battle of wits with his mother. The grand old lady would voice her policy of the spiritual journey as all encompassing while her son would try to churn out hundreds of conversations why hard work and commitment to basic issues were more important than spirituality. N.J. Yashasvi was fortunate to have lived a fulfilling and supremely satisfying family life. His phenomenal career began in a modest manner with a brief stint at ITC as a management trainee. Thereafter, Mr. Yashasvi joined as a faculty member with Administrative Staff College of India in 1974. N.J. Yashasvi spurned an offer to teach at the prestigious University of Singapore's Accountancy Department as he informed Professor Bhanoji Rao Garu that he felt that he had some important contribution to make in India. In 1981, he started his consultancy firm Yashasvi Management Associates Private Limited and from then onwards there was no looking back. It was in 1984 that he started the ICFI Society. In 1995, he was instrumental in setting of ICFI business schools across eight locations in India. He was charismatic a great motivator, never tired of talking about ideas, their execution and delegating projects ably to people according to their strengths. He showed his prowess in corporatizing education and created a sterling model out of it. If you are a man in hurry, it is not the business to be ill. And what I mean to say is that it takes at least a hundred years before a university is really recognized in a true sense. The grandfather should study there, then the father should study there, then the child should study there, then the child's child should study there. A pioneer, a leader and innovator, NJY created Andhra Pradesh's first private placement industry, first leasing deals, first stock market newsletters, first management consultancy and the earliest traces of knowledge society. He loved knowledge, science and new ideas that change the world. Yet, he remained humble, always working with a motivation to do something different, to make a difference to the world of business, education, business education and publications. I knew Mr. SSC when he joined the Administrative Staff College of India in the year 1974. He taught finance courses. He was an outstanding teacher in that college. He also wrote books in the area of finance and investments which can be easily understood by common man. He is extremely clear in his thinking. His motive was meritum ethicus, that is provide merit, give preference always to merit and be ethical in all your administration and management practices. He had the flair to make everything look simple to accomplish, even to an ordinary mortal. A powerhouse of energy and enthusiasm, his repertoire of achievements in education is amazing. Whether it was a launching of the Chartered Financial Analyst Program to make true financial management available to the Indian youth way back in 1985, or constantly updating it to suit emerging needs of the Indian financial markets, starting new programs for the changing needs of the reforming and liberalized Indian markets, or redrafting the curriculum for an existing program to align it with the changing business environment, he sailed through them with effortless ease of a true genius. N.J. Yashasvi possessed a remarkable sense of social responsibilities, aesthetics, scientific and intellectual temper and cultural sentiments. What came naturally to him was his ability to make gold out of dust. A seemingly useless idea or an innocuous thing would spark a business model in his mind. And he was a great practitioner in possibility thinking. In that sense, he was a great economic naturalist, allocating capital to get optimal and even phenomenal returns with scarce resources. A gifted communicator, N.J. Yashasvi masterfully articulated the need for a new university with government authorities, 
and went on to establish universities with competent faculty, duly supported by requisite infrastructure, designed the campus for a newly approved university, challenging great odds in his own inimitable style. Bequeathing the coming generations with a rich legacy of publications, he published innumerable books on current topics of management with his unabated desire to bring the latest knowledge to the doorsteps of the Indian academic institution. An achiever par excellence, N.J. Yashasvi was, however, not one to court publicity. His favorite retreat was his corner chair, surrounded by his books and photos in plot number 19, Nagarjuna Hills, from where he generated ideas that changed the educational scenario and his worthy emissaries emulated his ideals touching the peaks of success and turning their mentors dreams into vibrant realities in the last two years he started several new projects turning to his roots giving his mother tongue and traditions a philip he ventured to promote carnatic music established b ed colleges and also a unique initiative called C.P. Brown Academy, which is today successfully bringing timeless works of Telugu arts and literature within reach of the current generation. NJY achieved so much at just 61, and yet there were so many projects at hand. His entrepreneurial zeal never diminished. For his unrivaled contributions to education, Sri Yashasvi truly deserves a place in the history of the business scenario of Andhra Pradesh and Indian education in general for his life's work. Thousands of employees of the Ikfai employees, including people, grew like saplings under the banyan tree called Ikfai, which spawned the biggest service sector boom in education, research, publication and policy making. Some of India's most successful fund managers, analysts, bankers, journalists, software and management professionals, thought leaders and thinking elite have some connection or the other with ICFI. Either they worked at ICFI or they studied at ICFI and its associate wings. The causes he expounded were noble and it is the duty of his protégés to carry them forward. This is the greatest tribute one can pay to him, standing as living testimonies of his life's mission. कर्मण्येवाधिकारस्ते मा फलेशु कदाचन मा कर्म फलहे तुर्भू मा ते संगोस्त्व कर्मणी This film will take you through the story of an extraordinary visionary we pay tribute to one of the most resplendent intellectuals India has ever seen. The iconic N.J. Yashasvi, the man who founded the Institute of Chartered Financial Analysts of India, ICFI, and ICFI Universities and ICFI Group of Institutions. He leaves behind him a huge network of educational institutions that will stand testimony to the adage, what can be imagined can be achieved. Born on 9th February 1950 to father Sri Nanduri Venkateshwar Rao, a school teacher, and Srimati Sita Magaru, a homemaker, the quest of knowledge, the zeal to excel, was instilled in him right from his childhood. The spark of brilliance was evident in him right from his school days. His illuminating essays on a wide variety of topics, even when he was in the fourth grade, captured the attention of his teachers who appreciated and encouraged the remarkable talent in the young Yashasvi. The young boy was a keen and committed learner and he never repeated an error once it was pointed out to him. N.J. Yashasvi had a brilliant academic career throughout. 
Graduating from the Andhra University in 1969 with a BCom degree, he topped the university. In his CA Inter in the year 1971, he achieved near impossible scores as first ranker and repeated the academic feat in CA final in 1973. Simultaneously, he bagged the first rank in ICWA Inter in 1970 and ICWA final in 1972. This spectacular track record of academic achievements reached its zenith when he was given the Basu Foundation Award for the Best Student of the Year from both the Institute of Cost and Works Accountants of India in 1972 and the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India in 1973. A first of its kind achievement in the country, an unparalleled performance which made his parents and well-wishers immensely proud. Married to Srimati Shobharani, he had a blissful home atmosphere and the enlightening journey as a father husband and mentor crossed all boundaries as the most rewarding and enriching experience. Weekends at the NJY home was always known for his warm welcome to his circle of friends and associates. There would be a fruitful exchange of knowledge and fun, delicious home-cooked food and engaging battle of wits with his mother. The grand old lady would voice her policy of the spiritual journey as all-encompassing while her son would try to churn out hundreds of conversations why hard work and commitment to basic issues were more important than spirituality. N.J. Yashasvi was fortunate to have lived a fulfilling and supremely satisfying family life. His phenomenal career began in a modest manner with a brief stint at ITC as a management trainee. Thereafter, Mr. Yashasvi joined as a faculty member with Administrative Staff College of India in 1974. N.J. Yashasvi spurned an offer to teach at the prestigious University of Singapore's Accountancy Department as he informed Professor Bhanoji Rao Garu that he felt that he had some important contribution to make in India. In 1981, he started his consultancy firm Yashasvi Management Associates Private Limited and from then onwards there was no looking back. It was in 1984 that he started the ICFI Society. In 1995, he was instrumental in setting of ICFI business schools across eight locations in India. He was charismatic a great motivator, never tired of talking about ideas, their execution and delegating projects ably to people according to their strengths. He showed his prowess in corporatizing education and created a sterling model out of it. Arogyam dhanasampadaha 
शुभम कुरुत्वम कल्याणम आरोग्यम धन संपदा शत्रु बुद्धि विनाशाया दीपच If you are a man in hurry, it is not the business to be ill. And what I mean to say is that it takes at least a hundred years before a university is really recognized in a true sense. The grandfather should study there, then the father should study there, then the child should study there, then the child's child should study there. A pioneer, a leader, and innovator, NJY created Andhra Pradesh's first private placement industry, first leasing deals, first stock market newsletters, first management consultancy, and the earliest traces of knowledge society. He loved knowledge, science, and new ideas that changed the world. Yet, he remained humble, always working with a motivation to do something different, to make a difference to the world of business, education, business education and publications. I knew Mr. SSC when he joined the Administrative Staff College of India in the year 1974. He taught finance courses. He was an outstanding teacher in that college. He also wrote books in the area of finance and investments which can be easily understood by common man. He is extremely clear in his thinking. His motive was meritum ethicus, that is provide merit, give preference always to merit and be ethical in all your administration and management practices. He had the flair to make everything look simple to accomplish, even to an ordinary mortal. A powerhouse of energy and enthusiasm, his repertoire of achievements in education is amazing. Whether it was a launching of the Chartered Financial Analyst program to make true financial management available to the Indian youth way back in 1985, or constantly updating it to suit emerging needs of the Indian financial markets, starting new programs for the changing needs of the reforming and liberalized Indian markets, or redrafting the curriculum for an existing program to align it with the changing business environment, he sailed through them with effortless ease of a true genius. N.J. Yashasvi possessed a remarkable sense of social responsibilities, aesthetics, scientific and intellectual temper, and cultural sentiments. What came naturally to him was his ability to make gold out of dust. A seemingly useless idea or an innocuous thing would spark a business model in his mind and he was a great practitioner in possibility thinking. In that sense, he was a great economic naturalist, allocating capital to get optimal and even phenomenal returns with scarce resources. A gifted communicator, N.J. Yashasvi masterfully articulated the need for a new university with government authorities and went on to establish universities with competent faculty, duly supported by requisite infrastructure, designed the campus for a newly approved university, challenging great odds in his own inimitable style. 
Bequeathing the coming generations with a rich legacy of publications, he published innumerable books on current topics of management with his unabated desire to bring the latest knowledge to the doorsteps of the Indian Academic Institute. An achiever par excellence, N.J. Yashas.
good afternoon everybody on behalf of ifhe i welcome you all to the 12th njshv memorial lecture by professor janat shah former director i am udaipur i am privileged to introduce professor shah professor janat shah is the founding director of i am udaipur under his leadership i am udaipur has become the fastest growing management school in the country i am udaipur arrived at the global education strategy by getting accreditation from the aicsb in merely 8 years of its establishment with this achievement i am udaipur has joined the elite group of 5% of the world's b schools to be accredited by aicsb for consecutive 2 years i am udaipur has been listed on the qs and ft masters in management rankings i am udaipur is the youngest b school in the world on both these rankings i am udaipur is consistently counted among the top 5 institutes in india for research in management according to the methodology used by ut dallas after graduating as a mechanical engineer from the indian institute of technology mumbai he worked with industry for about 5 years he has obtained his fellow in management from iim ahmedabad before joining iim udaipur professor janat shah has been with iim bangalore as a faculty of operations management for almost 20 years recipient of several teaching awards he was also voted as the best teacher by mba class of 1999 he was the principal researcher of the team which has won ibm faculty awards three times in 2005 2006 and 2008 for their work on human resource supply chain management author of supply chain management text and cases professor shah is a leading authority in the fields of supply chain management and operation strategy he his book has been used in mba and executive mba courses at iim bangalore as well as at numerous other business schools throughout india he has also published extensively in national and international journals professor shah has consulted with a number of companies including aditya birla group bharti airtel ibm infosys limited mahindra and mahindra tata motors and tata delhi services he also helped companies design and development decision support systems for supply chain management janat shah has been the chairperson of the postgraduate program coordinator of the management program for technologies and chairperson supply chain management center at iim bangalore he was a visiting scholar at the sloan school of management mit he was also a visiting faculty for a term with the logistic institute at national university singapore he was the president of society of operations management india from 2008 to 2010 he currently holds a position of special professor at nottingham university He also has been associated with Seva Mandir as a president, non-executive role from September 2018. The non-profit organization works on the community development in and around Udaipur, Rajasthan. Welcome, you sir. I request our vice chancellor, Professor L S Ganesh, and Professor Janat Shah to come on to the dais. Thank you, sirs. I request our vice chancellor, Professor L S Ganesh, to start the proceedings. Namaste and good afternoon. Uh, let me begin by thanking all of you to be here. Uh, I would uh, say that uh, this is going to be a a wonderful afternoon because of what you will learn from a, one of the most highly accomplished uh, uh, intellectuals in the field of management okay. uh, my friend janat shah uh, we've known each other in a different context also but he has two connections one his student dr sudhakar who is sitting there is a part of the uh, sudhakar could you please stand up sudhakar please no i i think many of them don't know you that's why i'm saying please okay Dr. Sudhakar uh, has uh, helped us, the institution, in terms of 
the the promotion of our institute and uh, its value to society i'll put it that way we also have the honor of uh, uh, some of the uh, key people in the board of management and it's my duty to uh, to introduce you young students to uh, the people here we have mrs yashashwi here sitting here and she is the chairperson of the whole society and uh, we have shri v r shankara who is the president of the society of course v r shankara is the overall guide for what we do in the set of 11 universities that we have around the country and then we have professor uh, j mahender reddy who was the immediate previous vice chancellor and a very accomplished economist okay so he is also there and then uh, we have uh, professor banoji rao a very accomplished uh, economist and a very very good humored person i've always admired a sense of humor okay a very biting very quiet and biting humor if i may put it that way it's a rare quality and uh, this thing then we have professor kaushik earlier of uh, jawarlal nehru university and who was also uh, india's ambassador to one of the central asian republics if i'm not mistaken okay and we also have our other colleagues i think you will know all of them we have mr tp das sitting there we have mr nurus uh, uh, samad sitting there of course professor venugopal you have there and then uh, mr colonel vishwanath is also there so of course many of the other faculty members you will know i'm also thankful to faculty from different constituent units who have come here uh, janath is a wonderful speaker as you know he's already got a best teacher award and it's uh, obviously in i am bangalore getting a best teacher award is not a joke i can tell you that much okay uh, we related to each other from the point of view of the society of operations management uh, for some time okay i'm also happy that he's chosen this topic uh, he's a little apprehensive whether this topic will sort of cut ice and uh, i told him just don't worry it's an important topic for the country i thought i should give you a preface because of the situation all of us are in and uh, i'm a i'm a fan of trying to observe and understand paradoxes in our lives and one of the paradoxes which i've been continuously citing is that it's a fact which you can observe janath you will also appreciate this despite the fact which is verifiable that each country is fulfilling its sdgs at least to a significant effect uh, to a very significant extent i think professor banerjee rao you will love this paradox the planet is losing so obviously there is something going wrong i hope you got the uh, the paradox you know how is it that the individual constituent nations of the planet are winning but the planet is losing evidence you want just look at the world overshoot day i don't need to give you better evidence than that of how the planet is losing which automatically should mean to all of us this is connected very intimately with the development index which he is going to concentrate on and uh, the, it automatically should help you infer that the indicators that we are capturing are inadequate to represent the state of the planet i hope you got it simply inadequate so we're not capturing the whole set which we should so this is a deep question the same thing with india if you just look at how india is performing in the agricultural sector arguably we are number 1 in the world without doubt okay because if you see all the products which are listed will be 1 1 2 4 7 1 1 5 5 like that these are the rankings on many products okay we are the highest producer of in fact this is day for us today news we are the highest producer of good quality milk but we don't know where it's going and it was a few years ago i read the news that bombay was very proud of putting down 20000 liters in the arabian sea anyway it it just speaks volumes of what we are doing but we are very poor on the human human development index we have got back this is something we have to be very careful about i can appeal, only appeal to all of you and the second connection is service delivery systems okay you know in, we are transforming ourselves into a service economy so obviously this is going to be a very critical topic and i'm very happy that a scholar like janath is here janath we are all eager to listen to you we'll also have a q and a after this session and i hope uh, you people will spark him with your please juice him out with your questions okay thank you very much yes sir dr ganesh uh, mrs yashaswi distinguished guests 
faculty colleagues ladies and gentlemen lxi students i hope i didn't do something there i'm delighted to be here on this important occasion i've been really impressed with the vision and the foresight of mr yasasvi I've been really impressed with the vision and the foresight of Mr. Yasasvi, a leader who built 11 universities and nine business schools, taking education right into the heart of Northeast. No Indian entrepreneur in the field of education has been able to leave such a huge imprint in its institutional building. as mr yashasvi has done i think we owe a debt of gratitude to him as a person who has done so much for the education in india i'm truly honored to deliver this memorial lecture in his memory i did not get an opportunity to interact directly with mr yashasvi but i did hear him deliver one of his public talk in bangalore in early 90s and he spoke about his predictions about indian stock market in specific and india's story in general he was way ahead of his time and talked about the india story in a such an optimistic manner of course today everybody talks about this sure that within the next 5 years india will jump to notches and be the third largest economy recently goldman sachs talked about india becoming the second largest economy by 2075 surpassing usa in terms of economic size and actually if the predictions about china in terms of what we hearing today then we have opportunity to become number one economy now i'm indeed an optimist but i look at lot of this predictions with a pinch of salt in my view for several reasons related to our demography we may be able to take our rightful place in the world provided we put our house in order by investing in our human development before i go into details i would like to be upfront about couple of things first i am not an expert on development actually many people in this audience probably would know more about development than me but on this subject as a citizen you know as dr ganesh talked about as a citizens like all of you i am quite concerned so i am trying to see if we can apply some of the ideas from the managerial field like dr ganesh and few others in this group i work on industrial systems we call operations management that focus on making cars making cell phones delivering goods and services to your houses through e-commerce firms each of these industrial systems has delivery systems and scholars like dr ganesh and i work on them so today i'm going to put forth an argument that certain innovations from our field can help us redesign service delivery systems in important field involved with human development here i'm going to mainly focus on education and health but obviously it'll be a very limited perspective because we are dealing with a hard wicked problem of development so with this opening remarks let me speak on three issues first we will see 
how we define development and examine our performance over last several decades. Subsequently, we'll examine our current approach to service delivery systems in development and explore ways in which we can redesign them by borrowing ideas from industrial systems. I'm going to argue that the direction of our current approaches for development is incorrect. If we do not course correct, achieving the economic goals we have in mind may be out of reach. Subsequently, I'll talk about the way industrial organizations have evolved over the last 100 years. And we'll consider three case studies. Sector and two and be Based on his work, UNDP has designed Human Development Index that focuses on three things. One among them is a per capita income. Income is, of course, a very important part of human development. But as, as Professor Amritya Sen had argued, focusing only on income will be working with a limited view. Income is important, but if you do not focus on health and education, then the future development will not be sustainable. There are three components of human development index, health, education, and living standard. Health is operationalized by measuring life expectancy. Obviously, this is a limited view of health, but does give us some perspective. When measuring performance on education, there are two indicators. One is that if we take the whole population, whole stock, then what are the mean years of schooling? And second, if a child is born today, then what will be his or her expected days of schooling? And combining these two, you get the measurement of education. Third is the living standard in terms of income per capita. So every year, UNDP brings out Human Development Index where they measure composite human development index for all the countries. Let's try and understand how has India fared over the last 30 years. I'm looking at a 1990 as a benchmark year because all of us know, you know that was a major departure year for our country. So in 1990, we were ranked 130, you know, out of the list of 195 countries. And with a score of 0.434, and in 2021, which is based on the last report which came out in 2022, we are ranked 132. So we were 130, 130, and now we are 132 with a score of 0 0.633. And just to give a reference, Switzerland is ranked number one in 2021 with a score of 0 0.962. So of course, if we improved in the absolute sense. But relatively, we are more or less in the same position which we were in 2000, which were in 1990. To understand India's performance for comparison, we can look at performance of relatively large countries in our neighborhood, like China, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and of course, Pakistan. What's interesting is that all these countries have either improved or maintained their position in like India. Except for Pakistan, all other countries have a better rank on the UNDP index in 2021. So I think this is something we need to look at seriously. And let's ignore this 
comparisons for the time being. But look at the progress which we have made. In terms of expected years of schooling, we are now 11.9 years and we have a life expectancy of about 67.2 years. Indeed, we should be proud of the progress we have made on these measures. But I would like you to go a little beyond these numbers. For example, the expected years of schooling metric is a finally a proxy. The bigger question we need to ask is, what have they learned? We should be considering whether the expected years of schooling will actually result in better learning. Unfortunately, we have not done very well in terms of quality, both in education and health. And that's what I'd like to focus for the next few minutes. Let's talk about learning. One thing in which we are doing good is that our ch children are actually going to school. So most of the children are in school. But the important question is, do more years of schooling lead to better learning? So here I'm going to use some data from the Asar report by Pratham. So author, you know, Asar brings out report once in four years. And they provide information in terms of what's a learning outcome. And what we find that outcome has not been really satisfactory. Though ideally, when we look at education, we should be looking at a broader things like education should be opening minds. But I'm saying the least we expect that our children should be able to read and be numerate. Now, because of COVID, I'm not only going to give you data of 2022, because that can be misleading. I'm going to give you data of the last three, three surveys, which is 2014, 2018, and 2022. At the earlier level, the proportion of children in standard three who could read standard two level text rose from 23.6% in 2014 to 27.2% in 2018 and 20.5% 20 in 2022. So even if we ignore COVID years, then we are saying practically 80% of the children who are in standard three cannot read standard two level text. Similarly, proportion of children in standard five who could read standard two level text rose from 48% in 2014 to 50.4% in 2018, but fell to 42% in 2022. So we're saying more than half of our children who are in standard five cannot read standard two level text. When it comes to foundational numeracy, the proportion of our children in standard three who could do at least subtraction, which is supposed to be done at standard two level, rose from 25% in 2014 to 28.1% in 2018 and is 25.9% 20 in 2022. Similarly, the proportion of children in standard five who could solve a simple division problem rose from 26% to 27% in 2018 and is back to 25% in 2022. So we're saying 75% of our children who are in standard five cannot do this simple division work. So when you look at this data, they're very, you know, I mean, I mean, till you look at this data, you don't realize the enormity of the problem. Similarly, when we look at health, we discuss improvements in average life expectancy. But if we look at important measures like child mortality and malnutrition, our performance has not been great. The under five mortality rate is 31 deaths per thousand births. And the prevalence of stunt, stunting, which is a proxy for malnutrition, is about 31.8% per WHO standards. So whether we talk about, you know, 
child mortality or malnutrition, you will find our performance is significantly below what is again observed in a large countries in our neighborhood except Pakistan. So we are saying both by absolute and relative you know, standards, we have a long way to go. And with the lack of proper nutrition, you know, the specific stunting which we talked about, brain development would be hampered significantly. And children, when they join workforce, over a period of time, simply would not be able to contribute to society and become part of the global workforce. So on one hand, we are happy that there are more children are actually in school. But it's quite depressing to see that their learning outcomes are quite low. Life expectancy has improved, but the level of mild nutrition is high. We must examine what are we doing and what our direction is. If we are able to get the right direction, despite our performance lacking today, we still have a hope for the future. Now, in this area, you know, there's always constant debate that maybe we're not spending enough. What percentage of our GDP we're spending on health and education? In education circles, you know, there's always this discussion that we must, we should spend at least 6%. The question I'm going to raise is, how are we going to use that money which we're already spending? If spending more money is not going to translate into better learning outcomes, for example, in a education, primary education, then perhaps solution, are not going to, solution is not just increasing more budget. Let's look at what we have done in our you know, school education. 2009 saw the Right to Education Act come into effect. It's a very noble act provides for the right to free and compulsory education for children below six, between six to 14, and expects schools to have right kind of infrastructure. But would that necessarily lead to better outcomes? Our primary focus cannot be just inputs, that you increase more input, hopefully lead to higher output. You know? Now let's try and look at evidence in this area, because the act came in 2009. And I would like to present some interesting findings from, again, a report by Pratham. So what they did was, they rated all the schools which they were studied on the RT infrastructure score. So basically, RT talked about seven, infra seven dimensions, and for each dimension they gave a zero or one. And if you look at the learning outcome, and if you look at IRT infrastructure school, we found there's no correlation. We find that whether you had an RT infrastructure score of zero, or whether you had an RT infrastructure score of seven, or one or two, the learning outcome score was more or less similar. Basically, you know, surprisingly, but unfortunately true, that more focus on those inputs doesn't seem to translate into outcomes. So there's no guarantee that money spent on input parameters will actually translate into improved learning outcomes. Well, nothing wrong with improving performance infrastructure. But right now, we're only focused on those input parameters and with this input-oriented mindset, there's no guarantee of real outcomes. Later in my talk, I'll focus on such systems which focuses more on the outcomes rather than the inputs. One could perhaps argue that over a period of time, we'll figure it out our own way like we have done every time in the past, but the reason why this is such an urgent issue is because we are at a unique point in time in our history. 
I'm going to show you some data in terms of our demographics. We're going to get an opportunity which we simply cannot miss. And this is the reason why we need to work with a strong sense of urgency and find appropriate solutions in the immediate future. By 2030, India's working age population is expected to be about 1.04 billion, with a dependency ratio that be lowest in our history. Essentially, in a dependency ratio, you look at working age population and dependent population. And as I mentioned, we'll have the highest ratio of working population compared to all the large economies in the world contributing to almost a quarter of the incremental global workforce. The working age population bulge is expected to last for the next 30 years. All of us have heard about the Asian miracle. The Asian miracle was built on leveraging this trend. Japan entered the sweet spot in 1964. South Korea in 1967, and China in 1994. All these countries could take advantage of globalization and demographic dividend because they had invested in human resources in terms of education and health. India will be able to take advantage of this as well, provided we have a workforce which is educated and is healthy. Let me just summarize you know, our discussion so far. The bulk of our approaches are not going to give us meaningful results. Whether we talk about you know, the investment which we're making in a right to education related infrastructure, increase spent on teacher salaries, I'm not too sure all this is going to actually result in improved outcomes. In general, the take home must be that working with a high-cost approaches does not necessarily translate to successful outcomes. We need to develop models which are low to moderate cost while challenging ourselves and come, be able to come up with a more innovative solutions which relatively low cost and give us a higher quality outcomes. There are, you know, also these models need to be scalable because, you know, there's no point in having a model which works with the very small numbers. Let me turn to some ideas from innovations which have come from industrial systems. Taking the example of industrial production, if we adjust for inflation, the actual cost of products, say cars or cell phones, has gone down greatly as compared to probably 10 years, 20, 10 or 20 years back. We are getting a better product at a lower cost when we adjust for the inflation. This only happened through innovations and efficiency improvements. So the question we must consider is, how can we apply these lessons to systems within health and education? There are many interesting developments which happened in the last 100 years in industrial systems. There have been many revolutions in the industry. The first major revolution initiated by Ford Motor Company. In the 19th century, before the advent of Ford Motor Company, we used to follow a craft model. In a craft model of production, Every customer received their own customized product or a service, but this was very expensive and the quality was unreliable. Now, over a period of time, we've reached a stage where we should be able to provide, or at least in the future, we should be able to provide the same kind of individualized goods and services at significantly lower cost using this innovation in industrial systems. As I said, it started with the Ford Motor Company, and relatively, we had, recently we are talking about various 
digital technologies through which we are working on these innovations. I think that's where the future is headed. If we look at education, similarly, every child is a unique, so that what we need to do is to give a personalized and a customized education to every child. Similarly, in health, we must see if we can move towards a direction where every patient gets personalized me medicine according to his or her problem. I'm sure we're going to reach there in maybe next 50 to 100 years. But right now, I'm going to restrict myself to the modified version of Ford Modacus production system. And can we apply those ideas in service delivery systems in primary education and primary health care? Let me briefly describe the differences between a craft model, adapted, and the model adapted by the, which was prevalent in 19th century, and the model adapted by the Ford Motor Company. The person who was assembling the car at Ford, unlike our earlier approaches in a craft system, did not know the details of product engineering and production technology. However, in the craft model, the worker had the entire knowledge of both product technology and process technology, and the outcome was dependent on the skill of the worker. In case of education and health, if we draw a similar analogy, it is the teacher and the doctor. So we've been following a craft mode, craft mode of you know, production system where teacher and doctor are supposed to be highly skilled and ample knowledge. In a Ford Motor Company, they separated these two roles. They said the person who will design the tools would be different from the person who will be actually work on a car production. And with a result, they could reduce costs significantly and improve quality. Actually, we observed cost reduction to the extent of 80% during that time. I'm advocating that we follow similar ideas in education and healthcare sector. Let me illustrate this with three case studies. You know, and I'm going to first describe this organization. I'll start with Gyanshala. And I want to talk about these three factors which I talked about. That do you have a model which is scalable? Do you have a model which provides quality? Do you have a model which focuses on outcome, right? And also works at a low cost. So coming to scalability, Gyanstala started with few hundred students in year 2000. And today, they work with 24,000 students. They started in Ahmedabad. But now they have expanded their operations to three states. They work in Gujarat, Bihar, and Uttar Pradesh. Let me show the performance in terms of uh, outcomes. So here I'm going to you know, give data from a study which was carried out by MIT on those both dimensions which we talked about, the language and numeracy. The student language score was 35.4 compared to 18.8 in similar government school children. Similarly, in maths, Gyanshala children had an average score of 38.5 compared to 19.3 obtained in the government school children. There is this difference of almost two standard deviation, which is very difficult to achieve in any field. Okay. Let's look at our cost. In terms of the cost, the cost at Ganshala is one third of the cost of government schools. So essentially we see that one third at one third of government schools cost, Ganshala is able to give up education outcomes which are significantly higher. So let's see how they operate. So essentially they work with the infrastructure which is quite poor. Later on I'll show you a photograph of a typical classroom in a Ganshala. But they focus a lot on the pedagogy and the curriculum design. In terms of curriculum design, 
what they do is essentially the whole processes ensure the outcome independent irrespective of the quality of teacher so in their model the teacher has relatively smaller role first they try to create a safe atmosphere and most of the children work in a groups of 6 to 8 in every class the design is such that every subject takes only 15 minutes because you know it's been found that attention span of most children is not more than this so you have each module which is of 15 minutes teachers spend only about 20 to 25 percent on the blackboard for the rest of the class the children work in groups so it is not the teacher who is giving you knowledge but the design of the curriculum and pe pedagogy play a central role if the topic is subtraction then the teacher will not decide how subtraction has to be taught for every class there is a detailed design like which example has to be taken and every child has their own personal worksheet there there is a daily teaching plan and the role of the teacher is as a facilitator not as a provider of knowledge in regular schools the typical teacher would have specialized education for 2 years which is what i'm referring to a craft model so the more lens more focus on the resource person ensuring they are very skilled and therefore the outcome ought to depend on the teacher at gyan shala primary school teacher you know so if you look at a second or third standard teacher it would be typically 12th pass and that's all but they will select a teacher who is from the same locality most schools are in slums and cater to vulnerable sections of the society because the whole curriculum has been designed a detailed work plan is made and the teacher implements it so it's a very different approach from what you will see in most of the other schools in some way this idea is like that of ford motor company we are significantly lower cost without any compromise on quality another aspect which is very important especially in service delivery systems that nurses and teachers if they are from the similar socio economic background then you know they would have better connect with the children in general you know who are need services would have better connect the service provider and like car manufacturing or a cell phone manufacturing in education it is important that service who are provide service you know delivers with empathy and dignity so we are not selecting our front line operators you know nurses or teachers on the basis of knowledge but essentially they should come from a same community and they should have a high level of empathy so it's a very modified version of the assembly line approach used at the ford motor company in terms of the details of the model for every 30 students they have a teacher and every day teacher will spend minimum of 2 minutes with each student individually doing less on the blackboard which enables them to pay more attention to to the students and students get individualized attention and for every 10 children for every 10 teachers there is a field supervisor who will impart training and monitor there is also senior field supervisor and there is a highly specialized subject matter experts who designs the detailed curricular work design and all other issues let me come to the second example of arvind i care arvind i care you know has a facility which has got 14 i hospitals and 108 primary i care facilities in south india it provides large volume high quality and affordable care 50% of the patients receive service either free of cost or at a steeply subsidized rates yet the organization remains 
financially self-sustainable. Much importance is given to equity, ensuring that all patients are accorded the same high quality care and service, regardless of their economic status. A critical component of Arun model is high patient volume, which brings in with benefits of economy of scale. Arvind's unique assembly line approach increases significant productivity. And interestingly, Dr. V, the founder of Arvind Eye Care, borrowed initial ideas from McDonald's. Dr. V wanted to apply the assembly line efficiency that made hamburgers available on the street corners of every town in US at a price which everybody could afford. And he said, can't we bring those ideas in fighting this problem of blindness in India? You know, the mission of Arvind Eye Care is remove this unnecessary blindness in India. They've been able to reduce costs significantly, ensuring high quality, and this has been a scalable model. One of the measure of cost efficiency, which I talked about, is roughly 50% patient takes free treatment and remaining 50% pay a market price. You know, this would not have been possible unless they're working with a significantly high efficiency. And if you look at the scale, they do around 1,500 surgeries per day. If you compare their productivity with the average performance of eye surgeon in India, then about, you know, average surgeon in India typically does 300 surgeries per year. This is, I'm talking about eye care surgeries, right? Well, in Arvind, Arvind eye system, the typical similar number would be around 2,000. So almost six times higher, six to seven times higher. In terms of quality, I'll not go into details, but if you see any dimension of quality, the quality is compared to probably the best institutes in the world. And the, as I mentioned earlier, the quality of surgery is same for both paying and free patients. The rooms in which they reside are different, and the peripheral services are different, but there's no difference in terms of quality of healthcare between both paid patients and free patients. It'll be just interesting to understand how do they actually operate. You know? you know, if I just go back to, again, certain basic principles which are used in industrial systems, we do a comprehensive time study of delivery systems, and whatever an important resource is, we'll make sure is not idle. If we find the resources idle, we redesign the processes so that all critical resources are used to the fullest extent. In healthcare, doctor is the most critical resource. And service design should ensure that critical resource is used optimally. In a typical surgery, the resource used are a surgeon, microscope, nurse, instrument set, and operating table. And typical output, we talk about surgery per hour. At Irwin, each operating room has one surgeon in each room, one microscope, but there were two or more than two operating tables, multiple sets of equipment, and multiple nursing teams to carry out key non-surgical tasks. The unique operation theater layouts layout enables surgeons to complete a surgery turn around and start surgery on the next patient who's been set up on the next table in the same room. Let me just show you visually, you know, uh, just a photograph to give you a sense of, you know, what is a typical uh, operation theater looks like. You can just show this. So I'll just show you a photograph of a, you know, Arvind Eye Care Operation Theater, and similarly also Gyan Shala Classroom. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. I mean, this is the bulge which I was talking about, which we're going to see in 2030. Next slide. 
So this is a classroom in a Gyan Shala. This is actually a you know, very poor infrastructure. They essentially hire a classroom in a same neighborhood where the students come from, right? Next. So this is an operation theater, which is in Arvind Eye Care. And what you will see is, you know, what I was talking about, that there are two tables, right? And with a result, they also have a model where there are four tables. But they're able to use, you know, one microscope and a one surgeon. With a result, what happens is, when you finish one surgery, the surgeon, by that time, the second, you know, the patient on the second table is already ready. The surgeon immediately moves to the second, you know, table. And the, there's a swivel where microscope also shifts to the second table. So with a result, and you have a multiple nurse involved, multiple instruments involved. So with a result, they're able to ensure that you have highest utilization of surgeon, which is a critical resource, and microscope, which is an expensive instrument. Yeah. Thank you, you can switch it off. Yeah. I thought you know I can describe, but visually, you, if you can see, it'll give you much better sense. Okay. So as we discussed, they're able to use this expensive resources in a most optimal way. Similarly, when it comes to nurses, they do work, they do not work with the nurses trained by standard nursing colleges to lower their expenses. And their focus is only on eye care. They select nurses primarily from an empathy perspective. And secondly, they train them only for eye care. So again, the focus is on lowering the cost and ensuring high quality. So we see they have innovated in terms of their processes and the design of service delivery systems. Let me just talk about one more innovation which they have done in terms of their primary centers. They have a large number of primary centers in rural areas. So that now it's very difficult to get our doctors to go and stay in rural areas. So what they do is, you know, it's paramedics in the rural area will do bulk of the work. And then you, for a final diagnosis, using telemedicine, they'll involve the surgeon. Okay. So with a result, again, they have a very innovative way in which they're able to ensure high quality at a low cost and they're able to scale it up also. Now, you might say that, look, Arvind Eye Care is a very specialized eye care business and whether one can translate these ideas into primary health care. So that's the reason I want to take example of, you know, BHS basic health services which is not a large scale model, but applies this idea for a six clinics in a relatively, you know, I mean, so in a scale wise, they are small, but they have applied all these ideas in a rural healthcare systems. So they operate in Rajasthan. As I said, it's a smaller experiment. It's a six clinics and essentially operating in a tribal areas of South Rajasthan. So these clinics are managed by you know, primary healthcare nurses supported by visiting and on-call primary care physicians. Now, all of us know two out of three Indians reside in rural areas. And rural communities face a higher disease burden than others, but have much lower access to healthcare. One of the main reasons being that, you know, there's an uneven distribution of qualified healthcare providers between urban areas and rural areas. High quality healthcare professionals are not motivated to serve in rural areas. And, you know, resulting in a high absenteeism and low morale. Okay. So even though government professionals get paid significantly higher, the overall quality is low and costs are high. The WHO has recommended certain interesting ideas in this regard. 
they have recommended task shifting as an approach for handling this challenge in rural areas. So as per WHO, task shifting involves moving certain specific tasks where appropriate from highly qualified health workers to health workers with a shorter training and fewer qualification in order to make efficient use of available human resources. A typical staff strategy is upskilling of nurses to undertake larger responsibilities than, than their historically defined role of assisting a physician. And BHS has applied this idea of task shifting in a successful way. At BHS, most nurses are sourced from rural and tribal communities in which this clinic serves. Nurses from those communities are likely to have a higher retention than from urban areas. In clinics, nurses are interested in credentials to perform preliminary curative functions and enabled to do so through continuous training, standardized protocols, point of care diagnostics, and easy access to teleconsultation. PHC nurses reside in the clinic, clinic villages, and provide care on all days. The, the primary care physicians live in the nearby town and visit the clinic weekly on a designated days and is always available on teleconsultation. The PHC nurses are also equipped with a protocol to manage patients with an array of conditions and standard operating procedures to ensure the operations of the clinic are uniform and of high quality at all clinics. These are key principles which are essentially borrowed from a food border company production system ideas. While nurses manage most reproductive and child health conditions as well as communicable diseases, visiting physicians manage most of the non-communicable diseases. Patients pay a small user fees for a clinical services. The result at BGS clearly shows that the skilled and supported nurses are as effective as doctors in delivering primary health care. Higher pa patient satisfaction outcomes have been observed with nurses as the first point of contact and thus patients are more likely to keep their follow-up appointment with the nurses. The satisfaction also associated with greater engagement with the patient through counseling, two-way communication, and drawing from a context-specific real-life connect. Nurse-led clinics have been effective in providing specialized curative care and improving patient outcomes. Now, unlike, you know, Gyan Shala and Arvindai, uh, it's difficult to provide quality numbers for BHS. But the fact that BHS clinics are NABHE accredited and their repeat business is an indicative of quality of service provided by them. In recent study, it was found that 63% of total patient visits were a repeat visits. They reflects, this reflects the quality of care they receive at the clinic. Nurses get paid half of what government nurses are paid and with a result, Beach is able to provide high quality services, you know, at a lower cost. Now, now we have looked at all these three successful case studies. Let's try and look at characteristics common across these three cases. All three are innovative, outcome-based models, which are, which deliver moderate to high quality service at moderate to low cost and at a scale. As we discussed earlier, our current models in primary education healthcare are focused on increasing inputs, which does not necessarily translate into outcomes. We do not want to end up with a situation where we increase budget allocation on health and education, but the same is not translated into tangible outcomes. Education and healthcare are more manpower intensive. 
If we see the cost structure in both these areas, then the bulk of the cost is a manpower cost. We must now redesign jobs and move away from a craft model to innovative models, which essentially, as I said, modify some of the ideas which we talked about from a Ford Motor Company. Of course, this requires a mindset change in terms of the way we look at skill set of doctors, teachers, nurses. We must support them with a curriculum, protocols, necessary tools which are designed by subject experts so that frontline people with the lower skills are able to deliver high quality outcomes. This is important everywhere, but probably much more important in rural areas where two thirds of Indians live. And finally, it's important that we design these malls in a way that we deliver service with empathy and dignity. It's not just that we lower the cost and increase the outcome, but we must treat students as individuals and patients with dignity. I'm aware of the complexity of issues involved. Because of system design, redesign will involve redesigning the entire ecosystem. So a lot of questions will have to be solved. But the key characteristic would require us to stay focused more on performance outcomes and for that, a lot of innovation need to happen. So it's a quite a complex issue and requires attention of management, scholars, and practitioners. So let me just try and summarize my observations. Yes, all of us would like to believe that this is going to be India's century. We are best suited from the perspective of demographics. As we have seen in the past, Growth projections can be very deceptive. But history has shown, as we saw in the case of you know, whether it's a South Korea, whether it's a China, that when the moment comes, the country must be prepared to take advantage of the momentum. We have the right demographics in place, but unless we make sure that human talent is educated and healthy, we may not be in a position to take advantage. Unfortunately, our current service delivery systems in primary education and healthcare do not give us a confidence. Our service delivery systems are designed like craft systems and operate at relatively higher cost with unreliable outcomes. We must learn from these industrial systems that have delivered in terms of reduced cost and better outcome and can operate at a scale. We have seen this few case studies like Gyanshala in education, Arvind Eye Care, and BHS in healthcare, who have applied some of these ideas of industrial systems to come up with innovative models which operate at a scale. These low to moderate cost delivery systems operate at a scale with a relatively higher quality. I be we believe. We as a community of management practitioners and scholars should focus our energy on this very important and urgent problem. It should not be left to health and education experts alone. It's too important for that. We need to work there with them and redesign the service systems. This would help the country in taking advantage of golden opportunity you know, when we have this demographic dividend, and so we have this next 30 years. And if we take care of this, then there's a possibility that this century can become India's century. Thank you. Sir, in my uh, enthusiasm, 
I overlooked that there was a film on Sri and JSSV. <laughs> Apologies to everybody for this. Okay. Sometimes over enthusiasm is also dangerous. You know? <laughs> so, so we'll have a film on NJSSV. I'm sure all the young people here will admire. Please compare what an individual with little organizational business support has done for education in India, and particularly in the Northeast where nobody goes. I mean, that is the respect we have to show to a very great human being who has been in our midst, you know. Karmanyevadhikaraste Ma bhaleshu kadachana Ma karma bhalahe turbhu Ma te sangostva karmani This film will take you through the story of an extraordinary visionary we pay tribute to one of the most resplendent intellectuals India has ever seen. The iconic N.J. Yashaswi, the man who founded the Institute of Chartered Financial Analysts of India, ICFI, and ICFI Universities and ICFI Group of Institutions. He leaves behind him a huge network of educational institutions that will stand testimony to the adage, what can be imagined can be achieved. Born on 9th February 1950 to father Sri Nanduri Venkateshwar Rao, a school teacher, and Srimati Sita Magaru, a homemaker, the quest of knowledge, the zeal to excel, was instilled in him right from his childhood. The spark of brilliance was evident in him right from his school days. His illuminating essays on a wide variety of topics, even when he was in the fourth grade, captured the attention of his teachers, who appreciated and encouraged the remarkable talent in the young Yashasvi. The young boy was a keen and committed learner, and he never repeated an error once it was pointed out to him. N.J. Yashasvi had a brilliant academic career throughout, graduating from the Andhra University in 1969 with a B.Com degree, he topped the university. In his CA Inter in the year 1971, he achieved near impossible scores as first ranker and repeated the academic feat in CA final in 1973. Simultaneously, he bagged the first rank in ICWA Inter in 1970 and ICWA final in 1972. This spectacular track record of academic achievements reached its zenith when he was given the Basu Foundation Award for the Best Student of the Year from both the Institute of Cost and Works Accountants of India in 1972 and the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India in 1973. A first of its kind achievement in the country, an unparalleled performance which made his parents and well-wishers immensely proud. Married to Srimati Shobharani, he had a blissful home atmosphere and the enlightening journey as a father husband and mentor crossed all boundaries as the most rewarding and enriching experience. Weekends at the NJY home was always known for his warm welcome to his circle of friends and associates. There would be a fruitful exchange of knowledge and fun, delicious home-cooked food and engaging battle of wits with his mother. The grand old lady would voice her policy of the spiritual journey as all-encompassing while her son would try to churn out hundreds of conversations why hard work and commitment to basic issues were more important than spirituality. N.J. Yashasvi was fortunate to have lived a fulfilling and supremely satisfying family life. His phenomenal career began in a modest manner with a brief stint at ITC as a management trainee. Thereafter, Mr. Yashasvi joined as a faculty member with Administrative Staff College of India in 1974. N.J. Yashasvi spurned an offer to teach at the prestigious University of Singapore's Accountancy Department 
as he informed Professor Bhanoji Rao Garu that he felt that he had some important contribution to make in India. In 1981, he started his consultancy firm Yashasvi Management Associates Private Limited. And from then onwards, there was no looking back. It was in 1984 that he started the ICFI Society. In 1995, he was instrumental in setting of ICFI business schools across eight locations in India. He was charismatic, a great motivator, never tired of talking about ideas, their execution and delegating projects ably to people according to their strengths. He showed his prowess in corporatizing education and created a sterling model out of it. If you are a man in hurry, it is not the business to be ill. And what I mean to say is that it takes at least a hundred years before a university is really recognized in a true sense. The grandfather should study there, then the father should study there, then the child should study there, then the child's child should study there. A pioneer, a leader and innovator, NJY created Andhra Pradesh's first private placement industry, first leasing deals, first stock market newsletters, first management consultancy and the earliest traces of knowledge society. He loved knowledge, science and new ideas that change the world. Yet, he remained humble, always working with a motivation to do something different, to make a difference to the world of business, education, business education and publications. I knew Mr. SSC when he joined the Administrative Staff College of India in the year 1974. He taught finance courses. He was an outstanding teacher in that college. He also wrote books in the area of finance and investments which can be easily understood by common man. He is extremely clear in his thinking. His motive was meritum ethicus, that is provide merit, give preference always to merit and be ethical in all your administration and management practices. He had the flair to make everything look simple to accomplish, even to an ordinary mortal. A powerhouse of energy and enthusiasm, his repertoire of achievements in education is amazing. Whether it was a launching of the Chartered Financial Analyst program to make true financial management available to the Indian youth way back in 1985, or constantly updating it to suit emerging needs of the Indian financial markets, starting new programs for the changing needs of the reforming and liberalized Indian markets, or redrafting the curriculum for an existing program to align it with the changing business environment, he sailed through them with effortless ease of a true genius. N.J. Yashasvi possessed a remarkable sense of social responsibilities, aesthetics, scientific and intellectual temper and cultural sentiments. What came naturally to him was his ability to make gold out of dust. A seemingly useless idea or an innocuous thing would spark a business model in his mind. And he was a great practitioner in possibility thinking. In that sense, he was a great economic naturalist, allocating capital to get optimal and even phenomenal returns with scarce resources. A gifted communicator, N.J. Yashasvi masterfully articulated the need for a new university with government authorities and went on to establish universities with competent faculty, duly supported by requisite infrastructure, designed the campus for a newly approved university, challenging great odds in his own inimitable style. Bequeathing the coming generations with a rich legacy of publications, he published innumerable books on current topics of management with his unabated desire to bring the latest knowledge to the doorsteps of the Indian Academic Institute. An achiever par excellence, N.J. Yashasvi was, however, not one to court publicity. His favorite retreat was his corner chair, surrounded by his books and photos in plot number 19, Nagarjuna Hills, from where he generated ideas that changed the educational scenario. 
and his worthy emissaries emulated his ideals, touching the peaks of success and turning their mentors' dreams into vibrant realities. In the last two years, he started several new projects. Turning to his roots, giving his mother tongue and traditions of Philip, he ventured to promote Carnatic music, established B.Ed. colleges, and also a unique initiative called C.P. Brown Academy, which is today successfully bringing timeless works of Telugu arts and literature within reach of the current generation. NJY achieved so much at just 61, and yet there were so many projects at hand. His entrepreneurial zeal never diminished. For his unrivaled contributions to education, Sri Yashasvi truly deserves a place in the history of the business scenario of Andhra Pradesh and Indian education in general for his life's work. Thousands of employees of the Ikfai Gruis, including people, grew like saplings under the banyan tree called Ikfai, which spawned the biggest service sector boom in education, research, publication and policy making. Some of India's most successful fund managers, analysts, bankers, journalists, software and management professionals, thought leaders and thinking elite have some connection or the other with ICFI. Either they worked at ICFI or they studied at ICFI and its associate wings. The causes he expounded were noble and it is the duty of his protégés to carry them forward. This is the greatest tribute one can pay to him, standing as living testimonies of his life's mission. being here. After you demonstrate your passion, passion alone is not enough. I'm very passionate about Western rock music. Not enough. Demonstrate commitment in terms of time and effort. Okay. All passion need not translate into time and commitment for various reasons. Okay. So this has to be done. Only then we will win as a nation where we should win. Please understand, he talked of HDI, we are not doing well. Take the global competitiveness index, I'm sure our economists will tell you. We came from somewhere near 110 to as good a rank as 36 or 37. But again, we are sliding back. You know, we're coming to 70s. I'm talking to you as a fellow citizen, I'm sharing with you. I don't think, I feel ashamed when as a nation we are failing. 
Why is a nation of individually brilliant people becoming collectively mediocre? I don't understand this. But time for questions. You should answer the question, okay? <laughs> Sir, we'll give you the mic there. Yeah, yeah. The mic is coming. <coughs> Sir. Sir, hearty congratulations. It was an excellent lecture. I have attended all the 12 memorial lectures, including today's, and this was the best of all the lectures. Hearty congratulations. <laughs> Sir, my question is, you have referred to, and rightly so, on the importance of outcomes. You see, outcome is more important, and you have given so many examples. Uh, and, and the three components you have mentioned, the education component, includes, in my understanding, school education and college education as well. Now, the you, uh, everyone knows now the importance of the national education policy which was created by the cabinet under the chairmanship of the prime minister, which focuses on important word you have used, outcome-based education. So, do you think it is going to help what uh, the vice chancellor has mentioned that we are doing so poor on the H HDI? Uh, so what is your opinion on it and how we can? But the examples you have given are excellent, but my concern on scalability. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. No, first, thank you for your kind words. And uh, no, I, I think I touched more on the primary health care and the primary education because they are more foundation. But as you rightly said, we'll have to work on all the areas. Uh, one of the basic you know, point I was coming from <laughs> that probably we were left you know some of those key areas to only those subject matter experts i think we from a management professional need to bring in so so they are too important to be left to only health and pro education professionals i think there are a lot of lessons which can be brought from other areas where a lot of interesting innovations have come so that's first point Second, as you rightly said, the, I think we need to be, you know, to some extent, Dr. Ganesh was also saying similar. I think outcomes are important and we need to make sure. I think we need to move away from the input-based models. You know, we said we have worked so much, we have put so many training hours, we have done so much. I think we need to have a hard look at the outcome, saying, keep questioning that input must get translated into outcome. You know? I think NEP is an effort in the right direction. The only concern I have is we don't still have a roadmap there. I would have liked to see a you know, more detailed roadmap so that institution can also plan accordingly, you know, because there's a lot of work required by institution. Right? There's only one more piece I would like there is I think somewhere they should give a level playing field to Indian institutions. I think, you know, it's good to en encourage top, you know, foreign universities to come here, but provide a level playing field to the Indian institution also. You know? So there are just few observations, but just one more. I think just from a demographics perspective, we also have a window we need to take advantage. You know, the next 30 years, we are going to have this, we can become a workforce for the world, actually. Because if you look at the dependency ratio in terms of people who are between 15 and 65, right? That proportion, we are going to have the largest proportion over the next 30 years. If we miss that window, then we're going to have a larger number of dependent population compared to working population. So, somewhere we need to act with a sense of urgency. technology, I think we should be careful and very prudent in this. But there is a point 
जय मार सर आई वुड डेयर से अ पैशनेट टीचर अ पैशनेट स्टूडेंट हु इज पैशनेट टू शेयर नॉलेज एंड द अदर पैशनेट टू रिसीव नॉलेज डोंट नीड मोर देन अ ट्री एन ओपन स्काई एंड गुड वेदर टू प्रोड्यूस द आउटकम्स दैट वी शुड नो इट्स ओके ऑनेस्ट आई एम सेइंग आई थिंक द आउटकम्स विल बी ग्रेट i observe a lack of that thirst or passion to learn many people are lost in terms of coming into higher education i think in our country we said this no i think many teachers unfortunately i don't want to comment on any individual they drift into the education system you know they don't drive the education system sir i come from a business family fairly rich in madras but i came into education because i fell in love with it. This is a problem. Sir. It's a character problem, Jay. It is not a competence problem. Sorry, sorry. Anyway, yeah, though only thing I would like to add that I think it will be great if we have a large number of passionate teachers. Yeah, absolutely. But will be, but you can't hope for that. You know, we are in such a large country. So can we design in a way that even if we have a you know average. average teacher right and a student who is not so passionate but still we deliver a reasonably good outcome yeah. better than what we are doing <laughs> definitely yes <laughs> yes please <laughs> so you described how you could borrow from management now in the recent past we've seen how and this is not directly linked to what he's saying but how we we have had a few models in technology uh, where edtech did you know extensive and some have led to serious disappointment so the marriage of these different streams also has to be very genuine the educationists cannot take us to a backward that is the single most important point here you know and and uh, so no i i completely agree you know i was just saying that uh, we have obviously have to work with education and health experts together yes, yes. and together design our systems yes and also i think one critical element i'm not sure i communicated as well is saying that finally we are dealing with human beings you know we are dealing with a student we are dealing with patients so somewhere how do we make sure that empathy and the dignity yes. is a important pass yes. part of this so how do you marry all these pieces that's why it's a very complex problem so do you think it is the case that india does not celebrate educationists enough no. that we do not know no, we have a we have a late author who's been world number 1 in cases uh, yes Yes. When you are celebrating a sports person for chess championship mm -hmm. or a batsman for something, why not an intellectual for this output? I don't understand this. Yes. We don't celebrate the education. Yes. That's what I thought. We celebrate so. sports people and cinema stars, and celebrities are of that variety. But maybe that's the curse we live in. <laughs> Would you like to say something about that? No, I, th I think uh, the only only thing is. you know it doesn't necessarily have to be at a national level but if you are able to do it in our own communities right you know uh, for example ensuring that our alumni come back and recognize faculty right in terms of the kind of contribution they have made so i think it doesn't necessarily have to be only at a national level but if you are able to create opportunities where we you know so as i said for a, for a faculty you know one is a peers you know uh, celebrating that you know you get a rating i mean when peers recognize you as yes. somebody who has contributed and similarly your old student recognizing you mm -hmm. so i think we need to create those forums yes. where we connect with our old students we create an opportunity where we learn from each other right as a community so i think the point is well taken but create lot many forums yes one last thing sir you did talk about the numbers right in the beginning of your lecture and i think that's where the heart of the like last 30 years i've been going back to our villages to see and 
unbelievable how much village kids study and uh, you know especially with access to the internet now the dreams they have the yearning they have to study take higher education go out to the country learn but the thing is our numbers as a nation is so large that no matter how much we are doing it still se we are really seriously falling short so i'm so glad you brought up that point right in the beginning that look at our numbers you know while we are going up there is still so much and that somehow gets a little to understand that more granularly is probably the single biggest challenge here to solve the problem yeah it's a, it's a i mean so i mean somewhere if we are not able to give that opportunity to a child there yes right i think we are failing there when a child does not get an opportunity to get even the basic skills right so how he or she is going to be part of that global workforce there is opportunity there right but we are failing where you know we not giving the if if the child does not have a right in your nutrition then you're saying you know yes, how is he going to contribute he or yeah. she is going to contribute as a citizen right because you know the brain development takes place during that period so somewhere in those foundational years right both in the primary education and the primary health care we need to do lot more and current focus seems to be hoping that just give more inputs and it'll get solved it will get solved yeah but you know the data shows that actually that's a wrong approach and we don't know what is the fully right approach as yet so but at least let's allow more experiments you know so for example rt focuses on lot more inputs and lot of interesting schools which are doing experiments but does not have necessary infrastructure will not get accredited so somewhere give a lot more scope for experimentation you know i'm sure you face all these issues in your the things yes, you know yes. our aict comes and you know we are lucky in iams we are not affected but i know i am aware that kind of regulations they come in yes. the kind of restrictions which come in you know so allow more experimentation thank you sir thank you uh thank you sir thank you for your speech but sorry i i would uh, i would fully disagree with you that more input can transform to more output because the development theorist and uh, they say, says that more input will lead to more output and the, your uh, la, your uh, case studies are also saying the same thing like we are lacking behind in the development uh, indicators right because the the ideal amount of budget which you said 6% but till now we have not reached that 6% we are running with 2.9 or 3% of our budget right so still 3% of budget are needed to fulfill the inputs also so in suppose in school education the girls drop out in higher secondary education is high because maybe the, uh, the toilet is not there in the school maybe the school absenteeism teachers absenteeism is high maybe the uh, uh, teacher student ratio is high so less input is leading to less output right so in my theory or other development theories also say the same thing more input can lead you to more output develop and uh, development outputs again in your case also which you said in gyan sala case that is also referring the same thing more specialization uh, uh, of the doctors nurses and more uh, instruments can provide you better quality health care so that is how the more inputs are needed to to become get to get more uh, better outcome thank you sir so so you know let me probably uh, articulate a little better what i'm saying is we should move to more evidence based you know work that is why sir abhijit banerjee also they, they have Correct. worked a lot so that so provision of blackboard in the school can improve the quality of learning Correct. provision of uh, this uh, net mosquito net can improve the malaria cases so all i am saying is let all this come based on evidence rather than you know we keep saying that let's just give more inputs because i also showed you data that rte infrastructure scores you know which is part of a, a sir study which showed that irrespective of the 
you know, RT infrastructure score, whether you had a score of 7, whether you had a score of 3, or whether you had a score of 0, the learning outcome were similar. So to me, some of these are very disturbing. That, so all, I think, all we are saying is, stay focused on outcomes, keep experimenting, and see what works. Rather than simply saying that, you know, more input will definitely lead to more output, right? I'm not denying the fact that we should put have more input, but keep looking at. So, if I go back to the the the, you know, Arvind Iker example, they're saying right mix of resources, right? If required, put more resources which are less expensive in nature. So they're saying put more tables, but use only one, you know, microscope which you are able to swivel from one table to another. How do you use surgeon in a more effective way? Now, ideally you would like doctor to be there in the rural areas, but you also should realize that doctors are not going to go and stay there. So there is also a sense of reality, no point in hoping that I will somehow, you know, make it compulsory for a doctor to go and stay there. What you will see is a dissatisfied doctor lot of absenteeism and poor outcome. So I'm saying some of these are wrong approaches. Sir, in that case, that is the misutilization of resources. That means efficient allocation, uh, utilization of resources. And that, that is my point. Many things are misutilized in the system. So that we, you can uh, look into. But uh, specifically this SR report uh, that Pratham uh, NGO they, they do, See, after this uh, Sarva Sikha Abhijan, Right to Education, the school education has improved, enrollment ratio has improved. But the quality is still lacking behind. And that is uh, for other reasons also. So uh, that misallocation, yeah, we can, we can look into that. Thank you, sir. I request Madam Srimati Shobarani Yashashwi Garu to come on to the dais and felicitate our chief guest. So we are coming to the end of the program uh, regarding vote of thanks, I am privileged. On behalf of ICFI Foundation for Higher Education, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the Chancellor, Dr. C. Rangarajan, for his continuous support in conducting the event. We are highly <coughs> indebted to Professor Jain Shah, former director, I am Udaipur, for taking time from your busy schedule and sharing your valuable thoughts on improving performance on Human Development Index, redesigning service delivery system. Thank you, sir. <coughs> I extend my wholehearted thanks to our Vice Chancellor, Professor L.S. Ganesh, for all his valuable suggestions. Thank you, sir. We are grateful to Srimati N. Shobharani Yashashwi, Chairperson ICFI Group, for her gracious presence. Thank you, ma'am. We are thankful to Sri V.R. Shankaragaru, President ICFI Group, and Board of Governors of ICFI Society, for your continuous support all the time and your gracious presence today. Thank you, sir. I extend my wholehearted thanks to Professor J. Mahendra Redigaru, former Vice Chancellor, IFHE, 
and distinguished advisor ICFI Society, and to Professor R.P. Kaushik sir, Professor Banaji Rao Garu, and Professor T.P. Das for your gracious presence today. Thank you so much, sirs. I take this opportunity to thank all our directors, deans, heads of departments, esteemed colleagues, support staff for making this event a grand success. My sincere thanks to branding team, press, media for covering the event and their continuous support. Thank you one and all. I wish to convey a special note of thanks to FHA administration team for their untiring support in organizing the event. On behalf of our entire IFHE faculty members, last item is, on behalf of our entire IFHE faculty members, I want to express my sincere gratitude to Sri Enjavai sir for all his valuable guidance. We miss you, sir. Even after 12 years down the line, all the interactions, guidance, uh, meetings, advices, all are fresh in our minds and thoughts. We are trying to take IFHE forward. Thank you, one and all. Please join for high tea in big conference hall. Please join for high tea in big conference hall in the first floor of IBS. Thank you. Karmanye vajikaraste ma bhale shukadachana Ma karma phalakhe turbhu, ma te sangostva karmani. This film will take you through the story of an extraordinary visionary. We pay tribute to one of the most resplendent intellectuals India has ever seen. The iconic N.J. Yashasvi. The man who founded the Institute of Chartered Financial Analysts of India, ICFI, and ICFI Universities and ICFI Group of Institutions. He leaves behind him a huge network of educational institutions that will stand testimony to the adage, what can be imagined can be achieved. Born on 9th February 1950 to Father Sri Nanduri Venkateshwar Rao, a school teacher, and Srimati Sita Magaru, a homemaker, the quest of knowledge, the zeal to excel, was instilled in him right from his childhood. The spark of brilliance was evident in him right from his school days. His illuminating essays on a wide variety of topics, even when he was in the fourth grade, captured the attention of his teachers, who appreciated and encouraged the remarkable talent in the young Yashasvi. The young boy was a keen and committed learner, and he never repeated an error once it was pointed out to him. N.J. Yashasvi had a brilliant academic career throughout, graduating from the Andhra University in 1969 with a B.Com degree, he topped the university. In his C.A. Inter in the year 1971, he achieved near impossible scores as first ranker and repeated the academic feat in C.A. Final in 1973. Simultaneously, he bagged the first rank in ICWA Inter in 1970 and ICWA Final in 1972. This spectacular track record of academic achievements reached its zenith when he was given the Basu Foundation Award for the Best Student of the Year from both the Institute of Cost and Works Accountants of India in 1972 and the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India in 1973 a first-of-its-kind achievement in the country, an unparalleled performance which made his parents and well-wishers immensely proud. Married to Srimati Shobharani, he had a blissful home atmosphere and the enlightening journey as a father, husband and mentor crossed all boundaries as the most rewarding and enriching experience. Weekends at the NJY home was always known for his warm welcome to his circle of friends and associates. There would be a fruitful exchange of knowledge and fun, delicious home-cooked food 
and engaging battle of wits with his mother. The grand old lady would voice her policy of the spiritual journey as all-encompassing, while her son would try to churn out hundreds of conversations why hard work and commitment to basic issues were more important than spirituality. N.J. Yashaswi was fortunate to have lived a fulfilling and supremely satisfying family life. His phenomenal career began in a modest manner with a brief stint at ITC as a management trainee. Thereafter, Mr. Yashaswi joined as a faculty member with Administrative Staff College of India in 1974. N.J. Yashaswi spurned an offer to teach at the prestigious University of Singapore's Accountancy Department as he informed Professor Bhanoji Rao Garu that he felt that he had some important contribution to make in India. In 1981, he started his consultancy firm Yashaswi Management Associates Private Limited. And from then onwards, there was no looking back. It was in 1984 that he started the ICFI Society. In 1995, he was instrumental in setting of ICFI business schools across eight locations in India. He was charismatic. A great motivator, never tired of talking about ideas, their execution and delegating projects ably to people according to their strengths. He showed his prowess in corporatizing education and created a sterling model out of it. If you are a man in hurry, it is not the business to be in. And what I mean to say is that it takes at least a hundred years before a university is really recognized in a true sense. The grandfather should study there, then the father should study there, then the child should study there, then the child's child should study there. A pioneer, a leader and innovator, NJY created Andhra Pradesh's first private placement industry, first leasing deals, first stock market newsletters, first management consultancy, and the earliest traces of knowledge society. He loved knowledge, science, and new ideas that change the world. Yet, he remained humble, always working with a motivation to do something different, to make a difference to the world of business, education, business education, and publications. I knew Mr. SSC when he joined the Administrative Staff College of India in the year 1974. He taught finance courses. He was an outstanding teacher in that college. He also wrote books in the area of finance and investments, which can be easily understood by common man. He is extremely clear in his thinking. His motive was meritum ethicus, that is provide merit, give preference always to merit and be ethical in all your administration and management practices. He had the flair to make everything look simple to accomplish, even to an ordinary mortal. A powerhouse of energy and enthusiasm, his repertoire of achievements in education is amazing. Whether it was the launching of the Chartered Financial Analyst Program to make true financial management available to the Indian youth way back in 1985, or constantly updating it to suit emerging needs of the Indian financial markets, starting new programs for the changing needs of the reforming and liberalized Indian markets, or redrafting the curriculum for an existing program to align it with the changing business environment, he sailed through them with effortless ease of a true genius. N.J. Yashaswi possessed a remarkable sense of social responsibilities, aesthetics, scientific and intellectual temper, and cultural sentiments. What came naturally to him was his ability to make gold out of dust. A seemingly useless idea or an innocuous thing would spark a business model in his mind. And he was a great practitioner in possibility thinking. In that sense, he was a great economic naturalist, allocating capital to get optimal and even phenomenal returns with scarce resources. A gifted communicator, N.J. Yashaswi masterfully articulated the need for a new university with government authorities and went on to establish universities with competent faculty, 
duly supported by requisite infrastructure, designed the campus for a newly approved university, challenging great odds in his own inimitable style. Bequeathing the coming generations with a rich legacy of publications, he published innumerable books on current topics of management with his unabated desire to bring the latest knowledge to the doorsteps of the Indian academic institution. An achiever par excellence, N.J. Yashasvi was, however, not one to court publicity. His favorite retreat was his corner chair, surrounded by his books and photos in plot number 19, Nagarjuna Hills, from where he generated ideas that changed the educational scenario and his worthy emissaries emulated his ideals touching the peaks of success and turning their mentors dreams into vibrant realities in the last two years he started several new projects turning to his roots giving his mother tongue and traditions a philip he ventured to promote carnatic music established b ed colleges and also a unique initiative called C.P. Brown Academy, which is today successfully bringing timeless works of Telugu arts and literature within reach of the current generation. NJY achieved so much at just 61, and yet there were so many projects at hand. His entrepreneurial zeal never diminished. For his unrivaled contributions to education, Sri Yashasvi truly deserves a place in the history of the business scenario of Andhra Pradesh and Indian education in general for his life's work. Thousands of employees of the Ikfai employees, including people, grew like saplings under the banyan tree called Ikfai, which spawned the biggest service sector boom in education, research, publication and policy making. Some of India's most successful fund managers, analysts, bankers, journalists, software and management professionals, thought leaders and thinking elite have some connection or the other with ICFI. Either they worked at ICFI or they studied at ICFI and its associate wings. The causes he expounded were noble and it is the duty of his protégés to carry them forward. This is the greatest tribute one can pay to him, standing as living testimonies of his life's mission. कर्मण्येवाधिकारस्ते माफलेशु कदाचना माकर्म फलखे तुर्भुह माते संगोष्ठव कर्मणि This film will take you through the story of an extraordinary visionary. We pay tribute to one of the most resplendent intellectuals India has ever seen. The iconic N.J. Yashasvi, the man who founded the Institute of Chartered Financial Analysts of India, ICFI, and ICFI Universities 